All right, welcome back to lesson two of the Houdini Environment Beginner Series. We're going to continue where we left off in the first lesson and start talking about the different approaches to proceduralism and then the different approaches we can take in general when actually putting together an environment. So I'm going to showcase here again our sample environment. But in general, the two approaches, which we kind of learned about a little bit in lesson one of the beginner series. So again, I encourage you to check that out if you haven't yet that Houdini works in a procedural way. And the difference between the workflows is oftentimes determined by you when you're actually setting up the scene. So Houdini does have options to work in a fully destructive way. So you can model and place objects one by one. And there's also the option to work in a fully procedural way. So you could do everything without any manual input at all, which could be helpful but also does have some challenges. So an option for a fully manual environment or a destructive workflow, if we wanted to take for this environment, we could create each house manually. We could model the individual parts, the roofs, the panels, and everything one by one with traditional modeling, which would be extruding by hand, placing objects, uh, going one by one, beveling, loop cutting everything, kind of what you might see in a standard blender modeling workflow or box modeling techniques, which is a great skill to have, but it's not necessarily what we want if we want to make a big environment. So we would hand place those buildings, maybe rearrange them one by one. We would hand place every prop. We could even paint maybe the grass and maybe we'll paint a little area where grass is scattered and then scatter within a certain density on that area. But in general, if you do want to make a single environment, a manual or destructive workflow could be a great way to go, but then it does have a few challenges. So if you did want to make this whole building here and say we did a box modeling technique for this one, and then we decided later or an art lead decided later that, hey, we actually want, and I'm actually going to rearrange this a little bit. We want this building to be twice as long. So if we wanted to add that or say, hey, actually, instead of this dome, let's make it a two story building or extend this to have these two buildings connected. So these types of changes, once you're already done modeling, it's a little more difficult to set up because then if we had all this resolution here and it was already subdivided or beveled or all these things are set up, then changing that original shape becomes a little bit of a headache if you haven't planned on making those changes ahead of time. So another challenge might be if we need to take a city of 100 buildings and rotate them by 90 degrees randomly or maybe take half of them and scale them up to 25% bigger, then doing that manually and selecting one, two, three, four, five gets really, really tedious and also at some point unreasonable. And then also example, if you wanted to make a thousand buildings, you can't really model a thousand buildings, at least not in an effective way, but with a procedural approach, you can do uh, many, many buildings very easily. So then the option two would be a procedural approach, fully procedural, which would be us setting up all these recipes and instructions, kind of how we learned about in the lesson one of the beginner series for taking a task and a goal and breaking into the tasks and then assigning those tasks to Houdini. And then we can define rules for props and placements and scattering. But then that also does have its own challenges. So for example, we wanted to take this building and instead of a square building, we wanted to make it circular. Depending on how we set up our network, the rules and the actual nodes that we chose might not fit for that type of input. And we'll actually see that later. But for example, these buildings here, we're kind of making the assumption that there are four sides or at least right angle sides between each of these. So if we had a sphere or a circle as our input, it would not correctly create what we're expecting. And we can actually change that, but we have to know those edge cases ahead of time and then plan for our input to be changed, which is something we'll learn about as we continue to go. So don't worry too much about that. And then the other challenges we would have is if we want to manually place props in a fully procedural approach, it can get tedious. And then if we want to manually move procedurally placed 
objects as well. So say we wanted to take this house and then move it to the right or move this one two meters to the left. Also, depending on how you set it up, that could be a challenge to actually set up and implement correctly. So the main approach we're actually going to take is a blend between a fully destructive approach and a procedural approach, which we are going to be calling art directed proceduralism. So this will let us really use proceduralism for the important things. So the house, the, the big things that we want Houdini to actually do the main work on, but it will also give us the ability to manually place objects or have some more level of control at the higher level of our scene layout and then let Houdini manually, or not manually, let Houdini do the work itself. So like all these tiny rocks and grasses, technically Houdini would be great at placing these as long as it follows certain rules and we wouldn't want to waste our time manually placing these 10,000 something uh, instance rocks. So our blend is going to be a mix of these two and then you'll see as we go why you would choose this, why you would choose this, and then also how to implement uh, manual workflows and then how to implement procedural workflows. So I think in lesson 20, actually. And this is actually the full scene file you have here. The lesson slides are just to help stay organized and then get effective lesson plans. But yeah, in lesson 20, we'll actually extend a few of the setups here to showcase some of the revisions that you would make. So if an art lead came back and said, hey, this building needs to go, make it go away. Or we need to make this one over here and duplicate this one. So I'll show you how to set those up and then a few different ways actually on making sure that our procedural chain from placement to scattering to geometry attributes, to everything works in a way that is manageable and then is also efficient. So we're not wasting time and we're not repeating tasks that don't have to be repeated. But there's lots of cool things we'll learn and then it's going to be hopefully super, super in depth. So I'm excited to kind of keep going, but I would recommend you actually follow through this whole lesson series in the order it's prepared, because that will help you understand where everything fits together. And then all the dots will click at the end. Once you see how different changes earlier in the process. So earlier in the layout, how we move an object, how those different changes might affect the later setup. So. Hopefully you'll learn a lot and you'll get some cool uh, results and learning. So next up, we're going to cover the project file and then I'll get you started on actually setting it up and exploring some of these nodes. So we'll be back in one minute and then we'll get started.